so let's let's get started. I'm, I'm sorry for this initial delay. as usual usual stuff on, on presentations sometimes. So um, I'm very happy to see you all here. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, an open source solution that we have built. It's called TorDB. And, and basically, it presents a way of running NoSQL loads on top of a relational database. So this is something that can be used is if you're, like for instance, you're a, a DBA or you're running a relational database and you would like to offer to your users uh, some uh, NoSQL interfaces. So it's more than just having an structured data. This is something that's already possible in many uh, relational databases, like especially Postgres. It goes far, far than that. So I'd like to, to talk about, about this issue. A little bit about myself. Uh, before, I worked for a company called 8K Data. It's a research and development company on, on database, the database area. So we try to come up with crazy stuff. And this is one of those crazy ideas which we came up with, which happens, happens to be right now our main uh, line of development. So this is our core product right now. Uh, I also work as a programmer, so I'm both kind of a DBA programmer, and, and I'm based in Spain, in Madrid, where we also founded the Postgres Spanish community, which has become a really large Postgres community. We're very proud of that, more than uh, 500 people currently. And this is uh, a little bit about myself. If you just want to connect with me, find me on Twitter or LinkedIn or any place. If you have any question after this talk, I'll be around. But just in case if you want to write me, you know, this are the coordinates. So let's talk about a little bit about this, this problem that you may face. The, the world has definitely changed a lot in the last you know, five to 10 years. A lot of things have, ha have changed, and, and databases are no special. I mean, in general terms, technology has changed in so many areas. I'm not going to talk about that. But in the database field, it's been kind of a revolution in the last five to 10 years. There's been like 40 years where the relational technology, relational theory, has been developed and advancing and advancing and advancing. It has become probably better and better and better, but it was kind of stable. The players were more or less the same. The databases were more or less the same. The market was more or less the same. But now, in the last years, everything has changed. Many databases have started to appear. Many uh, new technologies have been introduced. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Can you see this picture? Me neither. I'm quite close. <laughs> I don't know if we can turn off some lights, maybe, or something. Or maybe, maybe those of you who are in the back may want to move to the front a little bit. I would say that's that's not bad. You can sleep if so you want. The last time they said they were leaving the light on because they were recording. Hmm. Yeah, there's a little thing in there that's not supposed to turn the lights on. Yeah, it just says like a little nothing. Yeah. So you don't do anything. No. Yeah. Probably not. Anyway, feel free to, to move to the front if, if you want. I think it's going to be better. You do some extra exercise, too. Well, so well, this picture, this picture on, is, is an event. And in 2005, you know, there were no lights. There were no you know, pictures taken by mobile phones and, and tablets, as in 2013, where everybody was with their own phone and tablet. I mean, things have changed lately. So also in the database field, as I was saying, so let's, let's imagine, right, you, you were a happy DBA. You were running your stuff. You were running your users. You were even happier if you were using Postgres, right? You were taking some time, and you were buffing your users when needed. And so it was, it was a happy life, right? It was, it was easy. Uh, the only problem that you have to deal with is basically those programmers who haven't met before uh, Mr. Bobby Tables, right? So it was a happy life. Now what happened? That at some point, NoSQL came into place, and people started yelling at you, hey, we want NoSQL. Hey, we want MongoDB. Hey, my app is web scale. <laughs> and problems started. Our peaceful life was kind of 
screwing, right? And, and now we need to, to know, we start defending, like, you know, this is kind of crap, you know, durability of concerns, transaction, you know, a lot of explaining. So rather than doing all this, why can't we say to you, these users, okay, so you want Mongo? That's okay. You want NoSQL? Sure. You want no, uh, web scale? Whatever that is? Sure, you can have it. And this is the promise that we are trying to deliver today. And uh, the way to do this is not by you know, installing MongoDB or, or Cassandra or any other NoSQL database, because that's a huge problem. It means if you need to start install a new stack, that means that you need probably new servers, you need uh, new support contracts, you need you know, probably people trained and certified, uh, you need new backup procedures, new security measures, new firewall rules, new network rules, and of course, once you have done that, you still have a lot of problems, like how do you synchronize data from one database to the other one? How you make that consistent? How you make sure if one user or one application is querying one data source, that the other one is gonna be up to date too? How do you move data between those? How do you ensure consistency? So this is a huge problem. So basically answering this question, Satisfying these needs, this request to have NoSQL on your data center, probably you have experienced that. It's a problem. So, fear no more. Here comes DoraDB. And DoraDB is basically, you can think of very simply as Postgres plus Mongo on the same place. So no new servers, no new stacks, no new certifications, no new even backup procedures. You have all that on the same place and it's open source. So let's put it very simply. What is StoreDB? StoreDB, it's a document database. It's a NoSQL database. It's a JSON database, if you want to call it that way. But happens to run on top of a relational database data store, which is Postgres. And it's open source. And the most important thing is that it is compatible with MongoDB at the wire protocol level. And of course, that means also the API. This basically means that as long as we speak the protocol that MongoDB speaks, there's no need to, to have you know, some different drivers, some different tools, the same tools, the same drivers, the same programs that run on MongoDB. It's a little bit of asterisk because of you know, compatibility, but basically all those work the same in TorDB. It just happened to have Postgres behind. So, first question. So, since MongoDB is non-structured, this hierarchical data store, and Postgres is relational, how do you map that? How do we store the information into Postgres? Well, this is probably one of the most important aspects of what we've done with StoreDB. This how do we store the information? And we don't just take the information and store it as a blob on Postgres. We could have done that, but we saw that there was a huge improvement, a lot of benefits of not doing so, and rather transforming in some way the data from an uh, unstructured way into a relational way. So, how do we do that? We take a JSON document, well, you're not going to see this. So, you take a JSON document, and we split that document into pieces, where each piece contains at most one level of nested uh, documents. Because you, you see, you know that JSON documents can be nested, can be all the documents within those. So we split them into pieces in such a way that there's no nested documents inside a single piece of this JSON field. We call that subdocuments. It's not a very original name, but anyway. Now we analyze the type of a subdocument because MongoDB or, or any NoSQL data store documents in general they don't have uh, they don't have uh, a schema, right? but they have types. Indeed, the MongoDB internal format, the BSON, it's typed. It specifies for each key what is the type of the value associated with that key. So we analyze the set of types that are within that subdocument, and that, if you think about it, pretty much looks like a table. So we have an attribute name, an attribute type, and a value. And indeed, that's a table for us. So we take each of these subdocuments find the candidate table which has the same attribute names and types and store it there. Store just, store just the values. What happens if we don't have such a table? 
Well, we, create, we will create the table dynamically. So you don't have to create a schema beforehand. You don't have to do basically anything. You just use an empty database, connect to RDB, start inserting documents with MongoDB API, MongoDB tools, MongoDB programs, and then SourceDB will take care of creating any needed tables, splitting the documents into these pieces, and, and you know, basically storing the information there. Let's look at an example, uh, because it's going to be easier. Can you read this on the back? All right. So this is a sample JSON document where it has like some, some levels of nested documents. So there is one field called name. I don't know if you can see the, the pointer, but anyway, for those who can. There's a, a field name and a field data and a field nested. These three form the root level of the document. So this is going to be one of the pieces in which we will split this document. Then there's another one here in horizontal called A uh, with uh, keys A and B. A42, B, hello world. This is another uh, level with, with no nested uh, elements. So this will be another part. Then there's another one with uh, J and deeper which is inside nested, which is another level. It's going to be another subdocument for us. And finally, this one, A and B. So ba we basically, the first step that we do is that we take this JSON document and split it into four pieces like this. The root level, which contains name, and then both data and nested, which are going to be kind of placeholders. They're going to contain the nested structures. Then we have A and B. We have J and deeper, which is another placeholder to, to basically um, say that the, there's a nested structure there, and the other A and B. Now, we find candidate tables for storing this information, which, map, which match this uh, column name and the data type, which is going to be an integer here, or a number, and, and the column B and, and a text field. If the table is not existing, we will create a table automatically for you, no problem. The placeholders, we don't need to store them because that's basically a pointer. Now, we're going to keep that, some, that information in another place. So this is how it looks like once we store this information into TorDB. We use some extra fields called the DID and index, which are not really important, but it's basically a, a way for us to pull back all the documents together. And then here's the information. Uh, MongoDB has an internal underscore ID field which is a 12-byte integer, 12-byte uh, array, sorry, um, which is hidden, but it's actually there, so it's, it also gets stored. So this is the root level, where if you remember, we have the name TorDB. As I mentioned, the placeholders need not to be stored. So basically, I just take the name and TorDB on the root table. This is a data table. It's called P underscore 3. It's being created automatically by TorDB. You don't need to do anything. Then we have... The A and B, 42 and Hello World, and notice that this table is going to be reused because it has the same column names, the same data types. So both subdocuments will be stored on the same table as we have here. And finally, the J, 42. So this is what we call the data tables. They contain the data uh, that MongoDB uh, document had before. Now, notice a couple of things here. This is just one document. If we store like many documents like this one, here in the JSON document in MongoDB, all this A and B, A and B, and the data types associated are repeated all the time. That's meta information that is attached to these documents. And we are repeating that only once. It's going to be on the table definition. So this means that the way of doing this First advantage, we are saving a lot of metadata. We are avoiding a lot of metadata repetition. Now, these are the data tables, but how do we pull back together the document to form the original JSON document that we had? Well, there's an extra table called structures. And this table, which is very important for us, basically is a tiny JSON document, small JSON document, which basically resembles the structure of the original document. It tells us where is the root level, what is the nested documents, and some other extra information. So basically, this structure says that the root information is going to be on table number three. If we go back to table number three, we see that this is effectively the root level. 
Then it says that the root level contains another field called data, which is a nested object, nested document, which is stored on table number one. So data is going to be on table number one. We go to table number one, and this is the data. This means null, and there was no index here, which means that this is, this is the data. And then there's a nested field, which is stored on table number two. If we go back to table number two, this is the net, what was inside the nested. And finally, nested contain a deeper element which is stored on table number one with index one. And if we go back, we see on table number one with index one that this is the other field that was there. So with these data tables and this structure table, we are able to reconstruct the whole document back again to where it belongs in this unstructured JSON format. <coughs> the good thing is that, again, we were saving before some metadata because it's repeated many times within a normal JSON collection. Now, this structure also happens to be repeated by itself. Documents in a large collection, most of them have more or less the same structure, the same shape, because they are alike. Otherwise, it would, would be really difficult to consume all the information in a NoSQL database. NoSQL means that you can change the schema, but you're not going to change it per document all the time because that would be crazy. How would you query that? So a lot of structures are repeated. And hey, you know, in relational theory, we have, well, not in relational theory, but in relational databases, we have foreign keys, right? And that means we establish a relation. So we also establish a relation in this final table, which is root table, which creates an association between documents and structures. So we have many documents which have the same structure, we will not need extra entries here in the table of structure. We'll just point to that structure. That's why we have a field called SID, which is the structure ID. So, if you think about it more visually, this is how more or less data is stored on a NoSQL database. Basically, any NoSQL database it stores data like this. It looks a little bit like a mess, doesn't it? Well, it is. Because documents are just stored one after the other one. It doesn't matter what information they contain. It doesn't matter how many fields or nested documents they have. They're just stored one after the other. Sure, there are indexes. But when, for any reason, you cannot use an index, then you're basically screwed up because you have to do a whole database or a whole collection scan to find your information because information is stored like this. After the process that we do in TorDB, the information is more or less stored like this. Just intuitively, you can imagine that it should be better. Because we classify documents by their shape, but the shape of their, to be more precise, of their sub-documents. We have analyzed exactly the data types that they have, the attribute, the columns that they have, and we have put them in separate bins. Now, this is what we call also partitioning by type. Because we're taking the data and we're classifying it depending on the type of the data and putting that on separate tables. That pr that's partitioning, right? So queries will be more efficient if we're targeting a given set or subsets of document types because we will, need be, we will only be looking at those partitions which refer to that data type, data structure. Now, this is a very typical question. In Postgres, there's JSONB. It was introduced in Postgres 9.4. It was significantly improved on Postgres 9.5. So why don't you use Postgres? Uh, JSONB type, data type. This is a data type for storing uh, JSON. You know you use JSONB, right? Well, I guess that's a yes anyway. So there are many reasons not to use it. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's absolutely cool. I love it. I love JSONB. And it's one of the most important features that came with Postgres. But it's not enough for our purposes because our goals are, first of all, we want to get the data normalized. We want to get the data partitioned by type as, as just shown you. But JSONB will do the same thing as NoSQL does. Store every document one after the other. Doesn't matter what type, what, what uh, structures they have, they will store in the same way. It, of course, does not provide a NoSQL API. So the problem that a lot of people are facing in the relational world is that they are asked to provide a NoSQL API. So basically, they have to install Mongo. JSONB will let you un uh, store unstructured data, but will not run a MongoDB program. 
StoreDB will, will, will allow you to run a MongoDB program on top of your Postgres database. Plus, it is, again, well, it's not compatible with MongoDB, and it can also not replicate or shard as MongoDB does, or NoSQL does. Think of that scaling, or horizontal scaling in Postgres and relational databases is hard, because the set of use cases that they represent is very wide, and doing a general solution for such a wide use case is very difficult. Now, NoSQL is using a smaller subset of that use case, which happens to be easier to scale. It's not free lunch, definitely. It has a lot of problems, but for, for whatever reason, people like it and use it and expect it. So I'll also talk about that a little bit later, but TorDB implements a MongoDB replication protocol too. So you can replicate from a MongoDB. So you can participate on a MongoDB cluster. That will not be provided by JSONB. And finally, JSONB is tied to Postgres. So far, TorDB runs on Postgres, but it will run on all the relational backends soon. So we want to make it run in different backends too. I already mentioned this. There's a lot of metadata repetition. Uh, if you look at the given collection, some documents have the same type, the same shape, and so this creates an overhead. If you use JSONB or NoSQL in general terms, you'll get a lot of this repetition, and this costs you disk space, I.O., memory, in, in shared buffers, and so on. So this brings us to what advantages does TorDB have over MongoDB? And the first one is related to this metadata repetition. As long as we are classifying the data and repeating the definition of those attributes and types at the table definition level, which means only one place, rather than every single document, we're saving a lot of disk space. And, well, honestly, disk space is not very expensive today, but I.O. is. And you can trade today disk space and price by I.O. So that means that basically if you're using less disk space, you can either pay less or you can pay the same and get a faster I.O. disk. And then, of course, you're using less memory. So this is really significant improvement. And basically, if you look at the numbers here, where we compare MongoDB um, with TorDB, basically TorDB just requires from 30% to 68% of the disk space that MongoDB requires. And this is not with compression. That's why we're using a MongoDB here without compression. This is before compression. This is not compression. This is just saving metadata, avoiding to repeat extra metadata that is repeated all the time on a, any NoSQL data store. All right, so this is the first advantage, basically I.O. The second advantage. It is surprising that NoSQL is trying to get back to SQL. That's why it's a badly chosen name, right? The problem is that either, as much as they are trying to get back to SQL, they're doing a poor job of going back to SQL, which is even more shameful. First of all, because what they call SQL, it's not SQL. It's SQLish. Looks like SQL. Like if you look at Cassandra, uh, uh, sorry, Couchbase, Nickel, and one QL, it looks like a lot like SQL. So developers are good for it, but it's not SQL. So tools are not that happy. Tools basically don't work. SQL tools don't work. BI tools don't work. GUI tools don't work because it's not SQL. So it's good for the developers, definitely not good for tools. And then even if they were absolutely compatible with SQL, that SQL is just a tiny subset of SQL. It's the basic select, where, join, you know, offset or something like that, but doesn't go farther than that. And you, we know that SQL is way more than that, right? Especially Postgres SQL is so advanced. So as a friend of mine says, Hopefully you're not stuck on Windows 3.11 days. And Windows 3.11 is when SQL 92 standard came up. And so these NoSQL databases that are trying to get this SQL-ish language, they are trying to make it compatible with a subset of what SQL was in year 92. 
which means basically you're not getting a lot of power. But Postgres has one of the most advanced SQL, most compatible SQLs available in relational databases. And guess what? It's free in our case. I mean, of course, Postgres too. But I mean, it comes for free. As long as we're using Postgres as the relational database backend, you get all this powerful SQL. So even though we support the MongoDB API, and you can insert data with the MongoDB API, MongoDB programs, drivers, whatever, that's good. But then, if you want to query in a more special way, if you want to use Power of SQL for querying data, say, sure, just go to the database. Don't go through our layer, per se. Just go to the database and run SQL. Tables look a little bit weird. Might be. There are solutions for that I'll present to you later. But anyway, I mean, it's SQL. It's tables. Just go and do it. And it's no, no SQL-ish and no subset. It's pure SQL. So that's why we, some time ago, we introduced what we call TorDB views. And these are machine generated. I mean, TorDB generates this, creates some views, which kind of try to pull back together all those tables in which documents were split by TorDB in the process of insertion and pull them back together so that they look like an entity that is easier to query. This, this views, so, well, basically, if, if we create something like this, which by, the, by means of varying fields, it will create different tables in TorDB. So these two documents will require four tables in total. And if we look at the views created, it all looks like it's been uh, put together. So it's, it's very convenient for basically doing queries. And in order to create these views, you just need to issue a MongoDB command, which is called createViewPath that we invented, so it's not you won't find that on MongoDB, but you will find that on TorDB. You can create that from your MongoDB program, and then you can use these queries. We also created a new MongoDB program you can run from the console or from the Java driver or whatever, which is called SQL Select. And you can just put a SQL Select in that, and it will go to the database, issue a SQL Select for you, and return the data as in MongoDB, as a, as a JSON document. So you have the full power of SQL at your hands with TorDB. You can even use tools. I mean, tools are compatible because, again, it's, it's SQL. It's not SQL-ish. Then we have what we call Toro, uh, query by structure. If you remember, we are partitioning the documents by the type that they have. So this partitioning, if you issue a query to TorDB and that query cannot use an index, uh, then in MongoDB, we'll, you'll need to scan the whole database. Rather here, we will look at the structure of the documents that fulfill your query and only scan those tables. So you basically can get a huge performance improvement. It can be as high as, as uh, the inverse of the likelihood of your document. Anyway, you know, it varies from query to query, but it can be really, really, really high. Even negative queries, which are queries that return zero, zero results, they can be resolved sometimes, but just by looking at the structure. So and the structures are in TorDB, they're cached to memory. So we could probably resolve negative queries just from memory compared to a whole database scan in MongoDB, which is, of course, almost infinitely faster, as, as much as you want. There's, of course, the possibility that you can mix and match relational and, and NoSQL data on your same database. Some people requested this. And basically, there's nothing we can, we can help with. I mean, you can do it. You don't need any kind of support. Just put TorDB and your relational data on the same database, probably in different schemas, just to make things clear. And don't write to TorDB uh, tables on your own. You could, but you know, just in case you don't screw it up. But other than that, you know, you can have your own relational tables and the Toro automatically generated data tables, and then query both to joins between your relational and NoSQL data. No problem. Then there is atomic operations. So MongoDB uh, doesn't have atomic operations. Well, a single document is called to be atomic because it's held by a glo uh, you know, an exclusive lock. So document per se, document operations are atomic. But if you do a batch operation, if you try to insert 10 documents at once, it's not atomic. In MongoDB, basically, you have to iterate through all the, all the documents to check whether they insert inserted correctly. If one fails, you, you have to probably, and, and you want that operation to be atomic, you'll need to delete the other documents that really got inserted. 
but then you'll need to check the results of that deletion because it may have failed too on some of them only. And then you'll need to kind of reverse that operation too. And it's, you know, it's a chicken net and egg endless problem unless everything works well. It's of course not all, all the time happens. So, I mean, we know the value of atomic operations. In MongoDB, there's no atomic batch operations. In ToroDB, it was hard for us not to support atomic operations. So, you know, it's, it's everything runs on transactions, and transactions are atomic units. So, we get them for free. There's another point. MongoDB, there's a huge debate whether MongoDB supports clean reads or not. Well, the reality is it doesn't support clean reads. A clean read means a read on a, on a consistent view of the database, on the data. I'm not going to get into the details um, unless, uh, if you want to, just let me know, raise, uh, raise your hand. But basically, MongoDB reads, uh, runs on, on read and committed, which means that you know, any, any new data can, can pop up in the middle of your query. And, and you'll, sorry, is that okay? Yeah. And, and you'll lose, uh, you'll, you'll see new documents popping up in the middle of your query. You can, you can see a document twice on a, on a given result. So, and well, of course, Postgres, it took us just two lines of code, you can see at the bottom, two lines of code to implement clean reads. We basically said, hey, query transactions are going to run on repeatable read mode in read-only mode. That's it. Clean reads for free. I mean, not for free, thanks to Postgres. It's a great database. This is very fun. You know the MongoDB 3.2, which was uh, released recently, and now support for a connector to connect to, Mongo, uh, to BI tools. That's why I said they are trying to come back to SQL, because they realize that SQL-based BI tools are better than the non-existing BI tools in MongoDB, or NoSQL for that matter. So the analysis connector. Do you know how it works internally? This proprietary, by the way, connector is not available on the MongoDB open source version. It's only on the enterprise version. But do you know which is the critical piece that makes that connector work? Postgres. Yeah. It works in Postgres. <laughs> really? Yes. So behind the scenes, this connector uses Postgres foreign data wrappers to convert from MongoDB to uh, relational tables. Guess what? That's called ToroDB. <laughs> and performance, it's, well, I can't speak because um, I have signed a license agreement which basically prohibits me of speaking about that performance. But it is dot, dot, dot. <laughs> really. I mean, just imagine, there's no push down, a lot of push down support on for Postgres foreign data wrappers. So, well, when foreign data wrappers and postures are going to get better, MongoDB BI connector is going to be better. Anyway, so they need this connector. It's proprietary. It's a slow. Oh, I said that. Well, whatever. And, you know, it requires Postgres. Why don't we use ToroDB? There's nothing else to add. I mean, MongoDB, the Mongo BI connector, the, sorry, the con BI connector is not needed. It's, it's Postgres. A lot of tools, most of the tools, BI tools work with Postgres already. So there's nothing else to do. All right. So what about performance? Because after all, we're doing a lot of stuff. We're receiving the document, speaking the Mongo protocol, which is not native for us. We're transforming, we're querying for tables, we're checking that those tables exist, we're creating tables, we're you know, splitting the data out. So I mean, there's no, no free lunch. There are no miracles in the world. I think there are a lot of advantages that probably outweigh the some, of course, these disadvantages that ToroDB has. Now, I don't want to play the benchmarking game because I hate it. So let me be quite upfront. MongoDB, when you look at MongoDB benchmarks, they don't benchmark what you're going to be using in production. MongoDB can have like many tunables, and the performance varies greatly from one tunable to the other one. Most benchmark that you see is running MongoDB in a completely unsafe way, in which you will never want to run that way. You'll lose data, for sure. Your database may become inconsistent. So don't look at those numbers. Look at the numbers who run MongoDB on what is called safe mode. Imagine what 
would happen if you don't use the safe mode. With journaling enabled, I, I don't see any scenario unless, you know, for some very particular use cases where you don't want journaling on your database. And with replication enabled, because basically, uh, if you don't use MongoDB with replication, I mean, if you use MongoDB on only one node, that's not a very interesting, you know, proposition. You're better off using Postgres. Or, yeah, of course, TorDB. So, when you enable all those things and then compare the performance with TorDB, honestly, with a very patched version of TorDB that was released, not published to GitHub yet, but, you know, released like six hours ago, the performance running IA Bench, which is a very uh, standard benchmarking software for MongoDB, results look like this. Higher is better. The line on top is Toro. <laughs> yeah. The, the reason, by the by way, the reason why the, this line ends up here, that's the question, is because this is just inserting 300,000 documents, so we required less time. So test is finished here. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. So, in other words, we are faster. This is pure insertion. So, if you wondered that, you know, all the stuff is going to be really expensive, it's not. And the most important reason why we are faster is because Postgres is fucking fast. It's not us. I mean, we're not smarter. It's Postgres. It's really, really fast. So, if you, enable, if you disable journaling or if you disable replication, MongoDB is going to be faster. But if you use MongoDB in the same way you would use it in production, we are faster. It's that simple. Um, oh, this is MongoDB 3.2 latest version, so this is not you know, uh, an old version, with, uh, compared with TorDB running on Postgres 9.5. It's significantly faster than Postgres on 9.4. All right. Let's quickly move over. How are we doing with time? All right. Replication. I mentioned that before. I'm just going to put it simple. We support replication. So one very interesting use case for this solution is rather than replace MongoDB, which I'd be happy if you do it that way, but it's just replicate from a MongoDB. So let's say some of your users or your yourselves have a MongoDB replica set running already with live data, probably used for OLTP. Now, you can set up TorDB to just listen on the replication protocol, connect to the MongoDB primary nodes or any uh, secondary node, which can also serve the replication data, and then have TorDB start replicating all the data live, like it's asynchronous, but it's usually fast, and you'll get another copy. And then you can run SQL on that. You can, of course, run the MongoDB API too, but you know, you can run SQL. So this is a very nice way of doing very cheap and fast ETL from MongoDB to SQL. Just use Tora. This is, by the way, this is present, uh, it's going to be released as, as TorDB 0.4. Uh, we're currently on 0.4 alpha 1 snapshot. Uh, but it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come anyway. If you, if you look at the devil repository, this is on GitHub. Anything is on GitHub. It's open source, AGPL. So just, just look at the development branch, and all the code is going to be there, except for the last, this latest benchmark. But, you know, it's going to be on Monday. So what about sharding? This is where everything becomes, like, really interesting, because we want to implement sharding a la MongoDB, which means implement the MongoDB sharding part of the protocol. This is not done yet. However, and we want to do this in such a way that, you know, TorDB will work exactly as MongoDB on a sharding environment. It will talk to the MongoS, which are kind of the coordinators on a sharding environment, and will talk with the other MongoDB nodes, you know, to move data around, you know, so just to participate in, in, in normal, normal um, sharding environments. It's not very difficult thing to do. We'll come on next version. Now, what if we, apart from doing that, which again, we're going to do that, 
What if we try some other ways of sharding information, sharding data within the relational world and shard below toward the B level? Well, we can do that. One option could be like PG shard, the sharding extension that Citus uh, data developed and it's also open source. Uh, we're also considering all the databases that are already good at charting at this level, like Greenplum or Redshift or Citus data too. So if we really pair this concept of sharding at the database level with the concept of replicating from, a no uh, from, from MongoDB replica set, what we're effectively building is a new way for NoSQL users to perform data warehousing, data analytics. So basically, this is a technology that will enable data warehousing for, as I say, those poor souls in, in the NoSQL world who are struggling to do this. If you try to do data warehousing in NoSQL, you're basically out of game. It's so terribly slow. You won't believe it. It's, it's basically unacceptable. That's why most NoSQL users are using tools for, to ETL from, from MongoDB or whatever to Postgres or, or other databases just for doing the analysis. So with TorDB, you can just replicate the data because you know, it talks, speaks the replication protocol, get the data to TorDB, and then use a, a backend which is already sharding at the database level. So we did some experiments. And we tried Greenplum. It's a great data warehouse. It was presented here yesterday. So we did some benchmarks with that. Uh, Greenplum was open sourced uh, late October last year. And we kind of already hiked toward DB to work on top of Greenplum. It's not released yet. But we did some benchmarks. The goal was exactly this, to take toward DB, connect to a MongoDB replica set, replicate the information from this replica set to TorDB. TorDB will uh, talk to Greenplum. Greenplum will shard the data across all the segments. And then we run SQL. We'll run distributed SQL, we call. SQL that will get pushed down to all the shards, to all the segments in, in Greenplum terminology, and get back to the results. And then we will compare how these SQLs obtained with uh, results obtained with SQL will compare to those results uh, run on MongoDB. I already told you it's very slow, so you can already guess the results. It's not really as surprising, but anyway. So we took some data set, the full Amazon review data set, which is a, um, a, a data set obtained by basically web scraping a lot of all, all the reviews of all the products that are in Amazon. Ran on Amazon Cloud. Uh, you use a C4 XLarge X large, uh, server, which is not a big machine. We want to show that you know this is what you may have at home. We set up four shards in the, inside the same host so that network traffic is not going to slow us down. In MongoDB case, that requires three config nodes. Config nodes basically do no jobs, just metadata, so it's, it doesn't add to the to the load anyway. They are required to run the cluster, so you have to have them anyway. And four shards and four segments in Greenplum, same size, same memory, same everything. Dataset contains 83 million records and 65 uh, gigabyte plain JSON file. So, if we import this in, into both MongoDB and TorDB running on Greenplum and compare the disk space required to store this dataset, the results are quite surprising. This is comparing Mongo 3.0 with WireTiger and Snappy compression enabled, which is kind of the, you know, in terms of disk space, it's the same thing as MongoDB 3.2. Just didn't repeat the test, but it's, it's the same thing. And, and on Greenplum, we were using columnar store and compression too to make this test fair. So I don't know if you can read the bars over there, but it's basically this big bar is Mongo, this small bar is Greenplum. And this is the same thing. These are kind of more or less the same, the index size. The table size is significantly, significantly smaller. Uh, from 20 gigabytes to 70. That's more or less the difference. It's so very significant. And why is all this? Because we are storing this metadata separately from the data, and we are not repeating the metadata all the time. 
and when you take that into account and you store it in a columnar way and then you compress it, it compresses very, very well because we have aligned data, we have classified the data, we have put it nicely on their own bins, and now we have compressed those bins. So it compresses very well. What about the, the benchmark itself? So if we take some, some queries, and what we're comparing here, if you remember, what we're trying to show here is to compare a query on MongoDB API versus a query on, on SQL once those tables have been generated by TorDB and imported via replication, right? So, uh, if we want to obtain, like, you know, like the uh, distinct uh, reviewers of products, the query in SQL looks like this, simple. Query MongoDB looks like this, weird. Um, but it basically does the same thing. So this is query one. This is another example of the query. Please let me know which one you can read and understand easier, the one on the left or the one on the right. Especially nice is this MongoDB allow disk use true. This is because MongoDB has a limit of 16 megabytes return on an aggregate query. So if you have a, an aggregate query on MongoDB and that aggregation produces a result larger than 16 megabytes, like you're, con you're doing a string concat or whatever, you're out of luck. You need to spill to disk if that's bigger than 16 megabytes. And, and it's really been automatic. You, you have to explicitly say, please use the disk. Well, so this is the benchmark. I don't know if the ones that are on the back can see these tiny, tiny, tiny bars over there. Yeah, that's TorDB and GreenPalm. Basically, the first query that we were simulating took 969 seconds to execute to complete on MongoDB and 35 seconds to complete on GreenPalm. That's a 28x improvement. The second query took 1,007 seconds on MongoDB and 13 seconds on GreenPlan to execute. That's a 75x improvement. The third query took 31 seconds on GreenPlan to execute. We don't know yet how much did it take on MongoDB because it crashes consistently, <laughs> very consistently. Um, we don't know the error, we don't understand it. So, you know, this is the idea. This is a en real enabler for data warehousing on, on NoSQL. So this is basically it. Please go to GitHub, download the source, try it, read about it. If you like it, please start it on GitHub. And of course, go and check out our FAQ. There's l many questions, probably some of those are gonna be asked now, but the rest of them are gonna be there, so just go and check, it, check them out. And that's it. Questions? Thank you. Do you have any plans uh, of uh, doing Redis or some other no yeah. Hmm. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good point. So the way we have laid out the source code, it's very modular and has some abstraction layers. And one of those abstraction layers is the, is the incoming protocol. So that's one layer, and so we right now have one layer called MongoWP, which is MongoDB Wire Protocol. Then it goes down to another layer called Kiwi Document, which is an abstraction of a, of a document. And we transform from MongoDB representation to an abstract key value document store, and then we process and do all the docu sub-document stuff and so on. So it's not hard to speak another protocol and transform to Kiwi Document, and then the rest of the thing will be exactly the same. So it's not hard. Now, this is prepared for, uh, I don't think it will run well uh, with pure key value stores. It will run better with document stores. Next on our list is gonna be Couchbase. More questions? I don't know the order just pop up. Okay, here. Who's using this in production? I hope nobody. I mean, this is still on the develop, development phase. So we're gonna release uh, mid-March, uh, mid-February uh, version 0.4, and the version after that is gonna be 0.8. Uh, we're going powers of two. And 
yeah, the first version was 0.1 and then 0.2, so this one is going to be 0.4, then it will be 0.8, and very soon after, we're going to be 1.0. So uh, it's not for production ready yet, but I uh, hope it will, and there's many people just trying out non-in-production loads. More questions over there? Okay, so this is basically very, very straightforward. Because first of all, in NoSQL, in, in unstructured data, there's no type change. If you remember from what I was saying before, the metadata which specifies the type is associated with the document itself, it comes with the data. So it's just a different type. It's not that it changed, it's a, it's a different type. So the way we process this is that, if you remember, we just analyze the subdocument and find a matching data type and, and value. If there is no table for that combination, we will create a new table. In other words, we will create a new table. Now, next question. Isn't that a problem? Are you going to be created thousands of tables? Well, sometimes yes. Sometimes yes, that may happen. If there is a lot of kind of combinatorial explosion of different keys and values and so on, which sometimes happen, we'll end up creating a lot of tables. But fortunately, this is not a big problem neither. Um, we have, we did a previous R&D project some three years ago in Postgres where we created a billion tables inside a Postgres database. And it worked quite well. And table creation was very fast. We were doing 12K, 12,000 tables per second creation. So, you know, it's not a big deal. More questions over there? I'm sorry, can you repeat it again? Oh, um, we're a little bit screwed up. <laughs> we just cut that key. There's, there's nothing else we can do. Yeah, yeah there's, there's some restrictions with, uh, with identifiers. But, you know, we escape some values and, and we, uh, we cut keys. Um, not really, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, re yeah, React is mostly key value. So we are, we are kind of, currently we're targeting more document data source than key value source. Because definitely key, key, a key value source is a completely different beast. Even though some key value source use, cons uh, use store documents where the document is a, is a, is a value, right? But the other way around, it's not on our roadmap. I won't say, can't say it can't be done. Maybe it's, it's great too, but I don't know. More questions? Sure? All right, anyway, I'm gonna be around. Um, I'm gonna be also on the Postgres booth in the next two hours or so. Feel free to pop in if you want to. And of course, if you have any question about Postgres um, and just, just let me know if you try it, let us know, give us feedback, and hopefully you like it. Thank you. <laughs>